Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. What you're listening to now is a part of a series on how to structure a growth team, and in particular, the marketing resources that generate sales leads. Now, every resourcing model along the in-house to outsourced spectrum is valid, uh, and they were all covered in the four-part series you're listening to, with each guest giving their take from their respective position as either an in-house or an external resource. Now, their views are here in these episodes. They're also in a webinar that's hosted by the agency behind this podcast, Marketing What's New. If you want to hear the full panel's answers that are grouped together to help you determine which in-house or outsource model is right for you, go to the Marketing What's New website and watch the recording. It's ungated, and I'll put the link in the show notes. This episode's perspective is giving that of a leader who's not a marketer, but who's in charge of marketing. And as she shares her views, listen in for the kind of numbers that they look at, as this person wanted to evaluate channels and how they're used to put their brand in front of prospects, how they look at external marketing providers differently from the way that they would look at an in-house resource they might hire, on a skill level, what she sees as the basics that a marketer should know. She calls that little M marketing versus a big M marketer. And how she, after rotating through several marketers and defaulting to doing it herself, found sites that gave her good content to help non-marketer people learn these skills. So let's meet our guest and check out what she has to say. My name is Pat Crosscomb. I'm the founder and CEO of BoardSpace. Awesome. It's great to have you, Pat. And uh, thank you very much for being part of this series that I'm doing on the topic of assembling the digital marketing function. Um, you're going to be giving us the vantage point of someone in a sub 10 person company who's doing digital campaigns on their own. So let me start by asking you a little bit about your company. Can you tell me what Board Space does? Board Space is an online portal designed specifically for volunteer boards of directors of condos and non for profits. It's a tool for directors to get organized and be able to find everything they need anywhere, anytime. That's great. And the company, I understand, is six years old now. Yes, it is. As of May 1st, actually. That's great. Congratulations. Yes, we're recording this in uh, May of 2020. So uh, can you tell me briefly what the main marketing activities are that BoardSpace does? How does it try to get interest from people? What kind of content is created? And maybe a bit about what channels you put that content out on. My focus from the very beginning was to create great content in my blogs. So that's really the probably the first marketing activity that I got started with, aside from having a website pre presence, obviously. So from having the blog content, I have then created social media posts in which to promote the blog. So we're active on Twitter, Facebook, and in the beginning, not so much on LinkedIn, but certainly very active on LinkedIn today. That's great. Uh, and the uh, SaaS offering that you have, I would imagine that once people understand that you can predict what kind of pain they have in running a board, that they'll come to your solution, give it a try. Can you just tell me a little bit about how they go through that journey? What steps you ask them to take? before they become a customer? Well, this is an interesting target market that I have because the decision to buy board space does not rely on one person. It relies on a board of directors generally making a decision to approve the product. So this creates a few extra wrinkles in the process. So I'm, I'm basically using... I've forgotten the question now, Glenn. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. Uh, Pat, you were talking about how you ask them or you offer them a few steps on the path to becoming customers. What are those steps? Uh, yes. Just let me think a moment here. Um, so my customers have become customers in a variety of different ways. In in the beginning and my my very earliest customers were those who I had met personally 
at a, usually at an event here in my home city of Ottawa. Those, those early customers have also shared, fortunately, positive experiences with other directors also locally. So some of those people come to me and basically they're all ready, you know, pretty much ready to buy. They just want a, a bit more information. So those are the easy ones. Yep. Other customers, you know, generally speaking, when a board is ready to start looking for some kind of technology tool, the first thing everyone does nowadays is to go searching on the internet. So yep. they they generally start looking, they find they find board space, and then from my website, they either request a demo directly, and then we meet on a video conference and I walk them through the software. At that point, then it's it can be highly variable in how long it takes the board to come to a decision. It can be within a couple of hours up to almost almost two years. And those are both real examples. I get that. And it's interesting. Like you said, you've got an interesting uh, target market. Uh, they, by the way, they behave, act like an enterprise purchaser because you know, who has a lot of complexity inside of their organization and it takes them a long time. It sounds like in your case, though, the transaction amounts are smaller, uh, yet uh, because they have to consult with so many stakeholders, it takes them a while. So they kind of, they're, they're big and they're small at the same time. And I would say that with boards of directors, when they're ready to go, they're ready to go. They're not like an enterprise. Well, maybe in some ways they're like an enterprise, but they have to be ready so if the board is in some kind of a, a chaotic situation, they could yep. be short of funds. It could right. be for any number of reasons. They simply delay taking on a new project like software until they're ready to do so. And there's nothing, there's nothing anyone can do to speed up that process. Right. So let's talk for a moment about some of the channels used uh, in light of the fact that people will be... Um, possibly looking for a long time before they decide on this sort of thing. You've got to keep content in front and you've got to have reach for that content. So uh, if we were to look at your stats, um, what would the main places that they come from? Uh, I imagine, like you said, organic is probably a place where people are coming to you from. But which social media channels are you getting people from? So I get a number of customers or a number of inquiries coming from Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I also have some affiliates who have board space listed on their website. So I get a number of direct inquiries coming from them. I'm all, I also have a newsletter and I use the newsletter to keep in touch with my customers as well as just anyone interested in, in, in board governance who may or may not be yet looking for a board management software solution. That's great. And uh, so now maybe you can take me a little bit inside of your company as far as the tools that you use um, beyond the ones out on your website that you know facilitate things like email or maybe that schedule posts on to Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, do you have a CRM? Yes, I'm using Fresh Sales. Okay, very good. So uh, number of pieces there, right? We've got already a pretty big tech stack uh, sitting on top of this site. I think you've got a WordPress site. So, you know, a fair number of things that uh, need to be run. And um, it, you know, sounds like that's a very good place to be in actually for a company who's five, six years uh, into their existence. But uh, you don't exactly have a team of people that are sitting building this and you know fleshing it out so tell me what the marketing resources have been in your team to get you this far well they've been pretty tiny okay i have had three co-op students who have done some of the marketing for me obviously those were very short-term placements four months I had a full-time marketing person who started last year. I was uh, had intended to hire him for six months, but unfortunately, he he left the company after three months. Okay. So the main marketing person has been me. So let's talk about you for a second. Uh, you have uh, 
is it fair to say you don't have a marketer's background? Um, I do understand that you have uh, in your background things that have lended themselves well to you writing a lot. So the content makes sense to me. But, you know, tell our listeners a bit about education wise and work wise where you've been before coming into board space. I have a very eclectic background. My, my first career was in agriculture. My last full-time job, well, paid job, was with Agriculture Canada. I love cows, dairy cows in particular. But that's not where I got most of the types of skills that are useful for becoming a, a marketer and a blogger. I also have a PhD in adult education, which certainly made me a much better writer than I had been before. But academic writing is really almost nothing like writing on the internet as well as writing for social media. So that's been a learning curve for me to take my writing skills and be able to translate them into blog friendly posts, social media friendly posts. And that's definitely been a long, hard journey of trying things out, finding out they don't work, trying something else, getting feedback from any number of different people, and then going back to the drawing board and trying it again. Um, Which I think describes the other part that I don't want to leave out about this, and that is that board space represents, if I'm right, your foray into being an entrepreneur. Correct. And I don't, I can't think of anything uh, that really is a better description of being an entrepreneur than what you just said about trying something, finding out it doesn't work, going back to the drawing board, trying something until you eventually nail it, right? Oh, very much so. And along the way, I've had some other types of uh, unusual and somewhat challenging experiences um, in, in other different parts of life, and they definitely are applicable to the entrepreneur who gets bad news one day, uh, finds out their tech stack has failed another day, uh, lose a staff person another day, and you have to pick up the pieces and keep going. Yes. I, and look, yeah, I want to make sure that we keep in mind here that you are in a typical day running a um, function that makes and keeps software running, not just uh, keeping a sales and marketing front office running. Um, But the good news is that the sales, the uh, the skill set that you need for both of those is remarkably, you know, the same. Maybe you could tell me, you you mentioned briefly about looking at um, bringing in full-time marketing staff and then you deciding with however it culminated that you would just go ahead and uh, take on the marketing function and keep the campaigns going. Can you tell me just a tiny bit about the thought process and, you know, what you imagined you would have to learn to be able to do it on your own? I would describe being an entrepreneur like running an ultra marathon, which I have done. And I didn't finish the first one that I ran. Yep. And so is it fair to say that the marketing function is just another, you know, leg of that marathon that you resigned yourself to running? Because as with so many other functions in a startup, you just figured out, well, it's got to be you doing it. Well, yes, because I definitely am a bootstrapped company. I have put all of my own money into the business. And so I, I always looked very, very carefully at what it would cost to hire marketing experts marketing expertise and it's expensive it definitely is expensive yep. and i always trade it off with you know can i afford to do this or can i afford to do it myself right and yep. early so- early early days i hired a social media company to do my first foray into social media so very very you know simple stuff is posting to you know facebook and twitter and and instagram and evergreening content. And in the end, I didn't keep up with that for very long. It wasn't effective, but I did take every opportunity to, to watch what they were doing. And then when I did it myself, I actually did a much better job because I understood the target market in a way that they could never understand it. Yep. Pros and cons for sure. Tell me a little bit about when you had 
the three months of a person who is a self-described marketing specialist. Can you tell me a little bit about maybe what they might have been doing and how you felt once they were done and how you would be able to pick up the pieces? What are some maybe pros and cons or lessons learned from doing that? Since I'm a blogger, I was able to engage my marketing guy in editing my blogs, which was very, very helpful. He was also able to take the blogs and post them on our WordPress site. He was also able to look at the WordPress site and run through the optimizations for search engine optimization using a common plugin, Yoast, used by a lot of WordPress sites. From there, he would read through the blog and identify short clips that would be appropriate to put out on social media, like a Twitter post or a slightly longer one for Facebook. He would then connect with Canva, which is a graphics program, create the graphics to go with with the post, and then set it up in the evergreen system that I've created within a software called eClincher, and then schedule those posts. So what else did he do? He also created some short videos for BoardSpace using a very basic uh, video editing program that I have Mm -hmm. and created several videos for that, a fun Christmas one, a fun, um, uh, just another one, and then some other ones for my demo pages. He also created landing pages to go with these videos and with other campaigns. So he was actually able to do a lot. But um, alas, once he left, now those have all fallen back in my lap. Right. Did the institutional memory stay, though? So you've described very well what he did. Were you able to just, you know, the day right after he was done, just jump in and do what you just described? Yes. Okay. So what happened? uh, I mean, did you define those processes before he arrived or did he jot them down? How did you know? Uh, to do those things in such detail uh, when, you know, when I think of hiring somebody, I think, well, they're going to know how to do it. So I can run off and do other things. I don't need to spend time watching and documenting what they're doing. So how did you manage that? I had all the processes in my head, essentially. I had made the decisions to use particular pieces of software. So I, I knew how to use them. And that's, and that's not something that he knew how to use. I use so many different pieces of software that it's pretty difficult to find someone who has the exact skill set with the exact program. So they were in my head. The main part, of course, is the WordPress website, which I didn't build it completely from scratch. And I've had lots of help along the way. But essentially, I could easily guide him through all the pages that had been created and point him in the right direction, point out things to avoid in setting up the various aspects. So those are all very much in the top of my head. I did encourage him to write some of those processes down, which he did do. So I have them as a record. I have not written down the processes in enough detail for sure. That's definitely one of my failings, but as a small business, that's always documentation is always the thing that falls by the wayside. Yep. As far as the blog content, I never expected him to be able to write the blog. So because I'm really the, the content expert in that area in terms of board governance. So I continued to write the blogs throughout. But it was easy, fairly easy for him to then pick out sort of highlights from those blogs and then create posts from them. Okay. And I do appreciate you letting us spend on uh, spend time on something that's, you know, probably not the brightest chapter. Um, but there are some key learnings, I think, that you've already helped us bring out about it. The last thing I would ask on that matter is, um, is there any advice you would give to other people listening in terms of how you assess the, the skill level of someone who says they're a marketer? Um I'm thinking that somebody listening might not have done as much of the defining of the tools as you did before, or maybe know the processes in their head. And when someone comes in and says, well, I know how to build this all and I can set it all up for you and, you know, don't worry about it. Um, What advice do you have for people to try and understand and get a, you know, just use their plain old horse sense to know if that person is telling them tall tales or if they are the real deal? 
I have definitely learned a lot from that experience. And a couple of the things that I have learned are there's marketing and then there's marketing. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so marketing for a SaaS company like mine with a fairly complex product like board space to me takes marketing to the the limits now so when i say there's marketing and marketing so the first marketing is so product marketing in a local market is very very different from marketing a saas product in an international market yep many of the skill sets are different and someone who can have a you know a diploma in marketing from a community college fits better the first type of marketing little m yes. marketing yes my kind of marketing is sort of the big m marketing is very very different so i definitely learned that lesson i had hired a small m marketer right. who didn't really have the um, skills in inbound marketing for an international audience lesson wow learned yeah there. yeah no and i really appreciate that and so if someone's listening and they're in that kind of arena, they do have to understand that the ask is much higher and they need to put a person who they're thinking of bringing on through that much more scrutiny. And another skill set, which is not specific to marketing, but definitely applicable for marketers is, is what I call digital literacy. And this is not age related because I'm certainly not a, uh, you know, a new graduate by any stretch. Right. But the d d digital literacy means the ability to look at a piece of software and figure out how to use it. In my line of work, in, in my marketing, my product, you have to be able to do this really, really quickly. I have a list of different products that I work with, and I'm sure that list is up to nearly 40 different types of software. Right. And, so that, no, and you're not done, right? I mean, there will be more. Yes, I'm always picking up new ones. And because I have picked up other types, I can pick up new ones faster. So that is definitely a skill set that's hard to um, hard to assess with a new person sure, in an interview. But I said you highlighted for anybody listening who's on the supply side trying to give uh, their services that the more they can do to be able to handle that 41st piece of software uh, by using some just basic literacy is going to make them a more a better candidate. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, any kind of, any kind of software, even if it's just like a, you know, a little tool to do a very small action, it's all useful information because that ability is really gold, really golden. Great. And you have highlighted that um, a person who is coming in as a specialist, at least by your analysis, your build versus buy scenario, they have a fairly high uh, cost in your eyes. So they really do have to have enough value to eclipse that cost and make it seem like it's a worthwhile exchange for you. I want to flip over for a quick second to, you know, you doing this on whatever frequency you do, keeping your marketing going. Maybe just take me through how you manage the challenge of flitting between marketing activities that you have and the other things that juggle for your attention. And if you can maybe share any work management style, any you know places where you jot stuff down, uh, any metrics, it, just help me understand how you try to do this, but do it very much on a part-time basis. This is the aspect that I struggle with the most because I'm a bootstrapped company and have to be a generalist and, and, and look after a back-end developer, front-end design, sales, marketing, and so on. I definitely rely on my lists. My developer and I have worked together for a long time, and so we created a very good, basically, Google Docs spreadsheet system that I have now copied to use with any other staff person, including myself. So yes. it's really simple. The best part of it is, is that we can share it. We can live edit at the same time and see what each other is adding. That's very, very useful. Yes. And I add priorities to each activity. And then I have a 
um, a sort set up so that I can resort things when things get done or priorities change on any particular item. So that's worked love, really, love really well with my backend developer. It's worked fairly well with me personally. Yes. But it doesn't work quite as well on a weekly basis or on a daily basis. So what I've tried sure. to do more recently is to set up goals, very specific goals for, let's say, LinkedIn. So my company page, my goal is to get three posts on my company page, three posts on my personal profile, and then my goal is to get my team to at least weekly comment, share, and like those posts. Right. And so your metrics will show the outcome of you doing those activities. Yes. And I like post-it notes. So I have big post-it notes on the wall, on my wall in front of me in my office with those goals listed on them. That's amazing. And, uh, I, you know, thinking of you wearing these different hats, I love how you are almost role playing through, you know, when you say, you know, with yourself, there's Pat, the CEO, and there's Pat, the marketer, and how you're using the metrics to go, you know, as the CEO might say to the marketer, well, last week, we didn't quite get the number that we wanted to. And, you know, the marketer responds, well, this week, I'll put even more out and we'll see if we can hit it. Something like that, right? Do, do you follow my meaning? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very <laughs> much so. Very A much meeting so. between me, myself and I. Yes. And I've also ha I've also asked my director of sales to help hold me accountable yes. on a weekly basis because I've asked him to do something. But then I'm also asking him to hold me accountable to doing what I said I would do. Because marketing is accountable to sales, uh, as it should be for things like uh, generating leads. That's perfect. And that, to me, seems like the scaffold that you can scale from. Um, so maybe as we wrap this to a, a close, uh, I know that you're kind of in this situation um, that you are. And like I said, we're recording uh, during the coronavirus. So things like changing the hiring and staffing situation is not on. Um, but maybe you could just tell me as we leave this, what kind of uh, pluses or minuses you see to the current mode that you're in and maybe what you think the long-term play might be, what kind of marketing function, you know, what would the resourcing for it be maybe a year from now? I'm not sure I understand your question quite, Glenn. <laughs> I'll take another crack. Maybe you could separate them into like two smaller ones. Yep. <laughs> One sec. <laughs> so, so, Pat, as we wrap up, when you're looking at the um, situation you're in right now, and like I said, we're uh, – recording at a time of coronavirus, so there's no staff changes anywhere in the picture. Uh, what would you say the long-term play is? How would you like your marketing function to be resourced maybe half a year or a year from now, if you got your way? Oh, definitely. In the, Within six months, I need to have a full-time marketing person with me working on board space. That absolutely has to happen. I can't continue to do this all myself. So that's definitely my goal. My shorter goal is, of course, to survive through this interesting time of coronavirus, and we are all going to survive, and board space will definitely survive, but we got to get through it. Sweet. And because you've gone through it in this way, could you maybe point out any silver linings to having been the CEO who puts on the marketing hat, what have you seen that maybe you wouldn't have seen otherwise? Uh, and what is it that you would encourage people if, you know, even if they played the undercover boss uh, scenario and jumped into the role for a little bit, what, what do you think is useful to learn uh, as you actually get your hands dirty in marketing that you might not know if you never, ever touch it? Well, given that marketing or sales were not my expertise from a previous life, I think it's not, I think, I know it is absolutely critical for founders of their own companies to have or learn those skill sets. Because if you don't know what marketing is, and if you don't know what inbound and marketing for a SaaS company means, 
then you can't really know if the person you're attempting to hire, be it full-time or a contract or a service provider, you can't really know if what they're proposing to you will be effective. And I learned the hard way, I'll give you an example, looking at Twitter. So I had never been a Twitter user until got, got going with it on the business. And the company that I hired to do social media, they, they, they increased the number of followers, the analytics looked great, but none of it was resulting in, in anything. There was no follow throughs, no click throughs, no comments being made. And I realized even more so today how easily uh, a naive founder can be fooled by very savvy marketers who know how to market themselves. So they definitely know how to market themselves to me. But if I don't know what they're, you know, really know what they're proposing, then I'm not going to be in the best position to make the right decision on who to hire. Yes. And though that hurts me as a marketing provider to hear that there are people out there like that, you're right. Uh, and it's important for a founder to know. It sounds to me like how everybody describes investments and financial services when they say, know what you're investing in. So um, you're, it's, that's well worth uh, the you know bother that you've gone to to raise it for uh, founders and that they need to, even if they don't, uh, you know, they're just not caught from that cloth and they don't necessarily think they uh, are strong on the marketing and sales front. That right there is a reason to at least get their head into it a little bit. And if I could just add, it's yep. it's not that it's not that marketers are any more or any less um, ethical businesses than any of the others that I have dealt with. They're definitely not. But what really matters is that marketers come to me, try and sell me services, but they can't understand my business as well as I do from simply looking at the website and preparing a pitch to me. So if I can't assess what they're offering, then I could easily be buying the wrong product, the wrong service, and they won't know either until months have gone by. So it's far better for me to be in the driver's seat, having done some of that driving and testing and failing many times to have a much better idea as to who actually is the right type of service for my kind of business. Uh, well said, and I guess that even applies to an in-house person that you might hire. You're that much better of a customer or an employer for having known this stuff and gotten through it yourself. Yes, and everyone tells founders that they must sell. They must be the primary salesperson, to which I fully agree. They must also be the primary marketing person as hmm. well in the beginning until such time that the company grows enough and those functions can be either, you know, gradually and partially handed off to others. And I hope to remain at least, you know, front and center with my customers for a very long time, because I think that's a, a very important role for founders to play. True. You'd mentioned before we got recording that there were a few resources that you found helpful to give you a, a ramp onto some of the marketing areas. Uh, are there any that you would care to share with people so that they can get a sense of maybe the, the coaching or community type uh, resources out there that they might use just to keep themselves slightly involved in marketing? There are lots of great resources for marketing. In fact, I would say there are far too many resources there. Yeah. But a couple of the of the very good ones is certainly the HubSpot website and uh, certification programs. Absolutely great and free. I've learned a lot from them. Some of the uh, programs that I have paid to be part of are the Growth University, which is a kind of a combination between a course and a coaching program. I also work with uh, Dan Martell's uh, Scaling SaaS Founders program, also one that I pay for, has content as well as sort of one-on-one -on -one coaching and ability to ask questions. I recently 
learned about a wonderful program called the Canada Job Training Grant, which gave the company funding in order to hire a, you know, a specific coach to work with uh, my team and I. And that one I never would have known about because it just wasn't front and center that I could use it for sales and marketing. Hmm. That's great. And you were willing to put in the time, though, to be trained. So that's, you know, that's part of the investment, too. But you're clearly willing to make it. Pat, I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing your vantage point of someone who, while you didn't start as a marketer, has definitely picked it up and done, from what I see, a great job of making sure that your company is known out there. How can people get in touch with you or with BoardSpace? Oh, I love hearing from people. So my... Are you going to add my email and phone number to this? Absolutely. Oh, sure. So, you know, anyone can send me an email, pat at boardspace.ca. Or feel free to pick up your phone and call me at 613-790-0225. That's fantastic. Uh, so, listen, thank you once again, Pat. I've really enjoyed having you on the show. Well, thanks very much, Glenn. I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to connect. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.